But welcome to the first TIA Centre seminar of the academic year. And so my name is Adam Shepherd, and I'm a postdoc here at the TIA Centre. So I know we've got a few new faces here. Uh, we're trying to have these seminars roughly twice a month. Um, so normally the first and third Mondays of the year of the um, of the month, at about two o'clock. Um, so yeah, today I'd like to introduce Dr. Zi Huang. Um, Zi is a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University. In August 2021, he received a PhD group. PhD degree from Purdue University, majoring in electrical and computer engineering. Prior to that, he received his Bachelor of Science degree in automation um, from Jiantong Shutong University School of Electronic and Information Engineering. His background is in the area of AI, digital pathology, and computational biology. From May 2019 to August 2019, he was, a, he was at Phillips Research North America as a research intern. And the title of Z's talk today is A Visual Language Foundation Model for Pathology Image Analysis Using Medical Twitter. So thank you very much, Z, for joining us. Um, it's really, really great to have you here. So just before we get started, can I just confirm again that you're happy if we record this talk and put it on YouTube? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for having me today. It's my definitely my pleasure and honor to be part of this uh, cool seminar at PIA Center. Um, yeah. Thanks for the introduction as well. I'm Zhi Huang, a postdoc at Stanford, work with James and Tom. Um, yeah, so today I would like to share our most recent research that has been published in Nature Medicine. Uh, uh, it's which using vision and language model for pathology image analysis uh, from medical Twitter. This work is collaborated with uh, um, Federico, which is co-first author and merge. Uh, this work is also advised by James and Tom Mounting at Stanford Medical School. Okay, uh, so I wanna give a little bit background and my understanding about the pathology. Um, in my personal uh, understanding, um, pathology diagnosis is a gold standard and it always informs all the subsequent medical decisions. Um, so basically, I'm trying to justify myself the utility of uh, analyzing the pathology images um, in my practice. So imagine a patient showing some sy symptoms, right? So uh, the patient may get a blood test and then went to the radiology department. Uh, the radiology image may reveal some patterns in the body. And if the radiology suspect uh, it's a cancer, the patient might have might need to have a surgery. And then the pathologist will examine a piece of patient tissue and make the final diagnosis. This diagnosis is crucial um, compared to radiology and a blood test, which uh, would I say crucial, it means uh, it is the, um, the diagnosis will be used for deciding what treatment com comes next. For example, uh, in, in different cancers. So pathology, in my understanding, is one of the most important part in medicine, but it is also the least automated field because the volume for pathology is way smaller than radiology and uh, blood tests. So here's a uh, so here's a what I see from different level of medicine, and uh, the most important and most difficult task, uh, in my perspective, is pathology. And the differential diagnosis, for example for cancer diagnosis uh, from pathologists can be important, uh, can be very important, which, uh, which can influence the treatment strategy, the first line treatment, the first line drug usage, and ultimately impact the survival rate and all the subsequent, um, such as the, um, um, the response to the disease. So it's very important. But although the uh, pathology is important and its medical scrum truths, clinicians often need consensus for a diagnosis. And here's a, a very good example on Twitter. I found uh, the other day I found a clinician was curious about whether other colleagues test KI67 antibody in breast carcinoma. She was actually surprised that the CAP, the College of American Pathologists, does not recommend performing the KI67 routinely. So following up to that po point, a clinician from Germany said, 
they always perform it and report it. And a clinician from Australia said it's about around 15% uh, of the time to perform KI-67 test. And a clinician from Spain said he always do it, but he believed a large amount of, of pathologists may not perform it. So uh, I think we have to accept the fact. So there's a large discordance on some of the pathology practice. Uh, in my personal experience at Stanford, um, most people, when, when people um, have an incoming tissue biopsy from endometrium tissue, they always perform H&E routinely stain images um, inspection along with CD138 staining to highlight the potential plasma cell. But um, to what I was told on the East Coast of U United States, uh, people are usually don't do the CD138 to find the plasma cell. Instead, they only check the plasma cell on H&E images. So like in different hospital and different region, um, different pathologists, I mean, they are experts, but uh, the way they look into the slide might be slightly different. So um, that's what I see for from my perspective. And here's another very interesting background. Do clinicians make diagnosis based on subjective gut feeling? Surprisingly, a recent interesting survey on Twitter suggests that over 57% of clinicians make diagnosis, including the use of a subjective gut feeling. Well, this doesn't, doesn't really apply that clinicians make arbitrary diagnosis, but it really underscores the necessity of for a for tools or algorithms to uh, alleviate or mitigate such disparity and subjectivity, or what people often call intra-observer variability, right? So how do we do with this, and uh, how do we what what can be a useful tool to assist pathologists? Um, I'm making a long introduction, but uh, feel free to stop me at any point. Um, from what I can see, uh, for example, a pathology search engine could be very useful that allows clinicians to match their incoming cases to other cases or their cl previous classical cases. Because pathologists often compare the cases they are working on with classic examples or the one or, or the previous slide they have gone over before. And this is how they learn and become better at their job. The more cases they see, the more they learn. Um, so could we could we also use a similar method to help pathologists to learn or simply assist them in retrieving similar cases to what they have on their hand and perhaps potentially enhance their diagnosis? I believe the answer is yes, right? So recent advance of pathology AI system um, or algorithms can help us distinguish cells or tissue types, generating diagnosis and retrieve relevant images. But the progress in computational pathology has also been constrained by the need of more diversified data sets that include well annotated labels in nature language, considering there are more than 8,000 disease types and their pathologic classification is constantly evolving and so we do face a limitation of data set with a more detailed nature language description. But at the same time, thousands of clinicians have been sharing de-identified pathology images with, along with very well annotated text on public forums, such as Twitter, Reddit, or other uh, social media. So this tremendous amount of data established a super valuable asset for use to train, could be a super valuable asset to train a general purpose AI for medicine, for pathology, that could assist us in learning, analyzing, or navigating digital slides. So how could how useful could those public data resource can be? To answer those aforementioned questions and interesting discussions in this work, um, we create open pass data sets from Twitter and uh, other public sources based on United States and Canadian uh, Association of Pathology hashtag guidelines 
proposed in 2016. Uh, in 2016, US CAP proposed uh, several hashtag suggestions for clinicians to share their interesting cases on, uh, especially on Twitter. Uh, those hashtags include such as cardiac path, um, breast path, uh, renal path, and so forth. We further um, define those hashtags uh, from 32 different subspecialties. So those are 32 different hashtags. Um, by extracting the data all the way from, from 20, uh, 2006 to 2022, which is about 16 years of history for the social media information, along with our stringent cohort inclusion and exclusion criteria, which includes only filtering out the language in English and remove all the potential retweets and remove all the potential sensitive images, plus additional tweet, uh, Twitter reply, which has the most likes, and also remove the sentences with question marks, which we believe it may contain limited information, and following up with a text cleaning, such as removing the emoji of the image, uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, of the caption in the Twitter post. So after question here, is that okay? Yep. Um, I just wondering really, so um, how, when you've downloaded these tweets, right, how do you go about actually removing sensitive data, for instance? Is, yeah, yeah. I'm assuming so, this isn't a manual go through each tweet process, is it? Yeah, yeah, so this is a great question. So uh, when we when we try to use API, uh, so in the end of the last year, Twitter API is still open for the public, especially for educational purpose. So when we use the API to extract those um, Twitter posts, um, they do have the uh, additional tag attached to each post, such as the sensitive is either true or false. So we do have the potential to get sensitive images. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, but those sensitive images are largely from like aut autopsy images, like the organ, right? So which is not necessary, not really a pathology image. So, so for instance, if it had like a I don't know a, a case number somehow attached to the image, would that that mm. wouldn't necessarily be excluded in that way, I suppose. Yeah, it's a good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting question. So, um, all all clinicians should uh, upload de-identified images along with de-identified text description. Yeah. So uh, that shouldn't have any patient information. Yeah. So we also train a um, pathology image classifier by using a bunch of pathology images and non-pathology images to build a binary classification task uh, and just simply remove all the other uh, irrelevant images such as selfies and PPT slides, so forth. Yeah, because sometimes when people post a sentence with a hashtag, um, very, uh, like in a, uh, not very often, but uh, sometimes they do post selfies or conference photos, yeah. So uh, in order to have a better and cleaner data set, we just remove them uh, up front. Yeah, so, and, and finally, we established over 200,000 high quality image taxpayers. And uh, this is a large public pathology visual language data set distributed among 32 different hashtags or pathology subspecialties. And perhaps the most different from the previous data set, such as ImageNet, is um, here, one image is paired with a, um, a nature language description in, instead of a categorical label. Uh, in OpenPass, each image right here uh, was described with over 20, uh, around or over 20 words of a description. With nature language, we believe it's better to explain the detail of the image. And uh, as you can see on the right uh, image, image on the right uh, panel, um, so most of the descriptions 
has longer longer sentence in words um, and the median number of tweets is 20 median number of replies top like the reply is uh, 15. Um, yeah I see a question yes one question so you have in Twitter they would put histology images but I also can put other images like they can put the whole organ that they have excised or something like that and that wouldn't be a microscopical image how do you distinguish between the two of them yeah, yeah. So uh, we have a classifier to uh, to remove the uh, yeah. So we have a classifier to remove those non pathology images, um, but the classifier is not perfect. Uh, after a ma manual check, we found ninety eight percent of the images are um, from a from a thousand of uh, random images. We found ninety eight percent of them are pathology related images. Uh, we do have a really rare amount of images are non-pathology images. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, so here's um, here uh, the previous uh, previously we introduced about the data, and here's how we use the the previous uh, the open pass data to train our pathology AI. For text in Twitter post, we just simply fed into a standard clip texting transformer. The clip model was proposed by OpenAI in 2021, which is a very mature and very robust and powerful um, model. We, uh, we fed the text into a standard clip encoder and converted uh, each sentence into a vector. And that vector is, um, in, in our case, is 512 by one dimension vector. For image in Twitter post, we also fed into a vision transformer, uh, the v VIT base 32, and converted into a vector with the same dimension, um, which is also 512 by one um, vector. In, uh, so, so those two vectors are in the same dimensional space. Um, in the same dimensional space, then we can compare the similarity, the cosine similarity between the text embedding and image embedding, right? So by training the clip model using contrastive learning loss, we impose, we try to impose a higher similarity between the paired image and text, which is on the diagonal. If you can see the I1 times T1, uh, I2 times T2, and so forth. So for, for the pairs that originally comes from the same post, we impose a higher cosine similarity for those image and text embeddings. But for the pairs that's from a different image and different uh, text, um, such as I1 times T2, um, we actually does not encourage a higher similarity. So this is a, a like very, um, very classic contrastive learning strategy. Um, and if you can see on the right hand side, um, over the iteration, the in the in the high dimensional space, the paired image and text um, vector will be actually getting closer and closer over the training iteration. So we train all. Uh, so we train this uh, classical clip model. Um, when we say train, we actually, the clip model is based on 400 million images um, uh, pre-trained. So we finally, uh, we do, we do an additional fine tuning on top of the uh, clip model and train with the entire open pass data. And formally we name it as clip model, which stands for pathology language image pre-training model. So uh, that's how we get the clip model from the open pass data. Okay, so the next is, uh, we, so it's time to evaluate the performance of the PLIP model. Um, the PLIP model trained from um, this contrastive learning can perform many downstream tasks. For example, PLIP can classify new images without further training. So this is what we call zero-shot learning. Essentially, zero-shot zero can be super helpful to classify image with any given set of candidate labels without further training. For example, here's the image I input. We uh, go through an image encoder, become an image vector. And I also input 
um, maybe 10 different um, labels such as tumor, adipose tissue, lymphocytes, and so forth. So we construct each label into a sentence, making it become a H&E image of tumor or adipose tissue or so forth, and fit into the text encoder. Then we get a list of vector which are representing uh, each different uh, sentences we were uh, we were uh, we inputted in, and then we uh, the final answer, the final correct prediction is which the candidate label with highest the cosine similarity with associated with the image. So zero shot learning is very useful as a versatile system for maybe the potential emergence of new disease subtypes or simply just for classifying images from several candidates um, can be very useful for rare or novel disease identification. We evaluate the zero-shot ability across four external independent data sets. So for cather column data set on the first column, we tested on nine different label candidates. Uh, then we tested pan nuke and digest path data set, which tested which we tested benign versus malignant tissues. And then we also tested uh, a data set from lung cancer, um, which is testing tumor versus normal tissue. So all the image testing are based on pathology image patch. It's not based on whole slide images. So we found PLIP achieves F1 score of around 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 compared to F1 score about 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 for the previous clip model, suggesting up to 28 times um, performance improvement um, in terms of weighted F1 score. And next, that's we further- That's a question, mm -hmm. That's a fantastic improvement. Um, I just wanted to ask about the uh, PANU data there. So how, because um, as far as I understand, it's nuclear labels, right? So yeah. how do you get uh, to benign versus malignant? Yeah, yeah, so this is a great question. Um, so in PANDUC data set, uh, the original data contains five different cell types, including neoplastic cells and uh, inflammatory cells um, and so forth. Um, on that data set, we try to get um, those different image patches, which has more than, I forgot the exact threshold, but the code is available in GitHub. Um, perhaps it's five, if more than five neoplastic cells appeared on a image patch, then we define it as malignant, suggesting it has more pattern of, of t tumor. If there are no um, neoplastic cell on, of the image patch, then we define it as benign. So we have a definition. Yeah. That, that makes sense. So there's also some patches there in the data set that aren't going to be that you, you exclude because you haven't got necessarily a label for mm -hmm. the ones with less yeah. than say five brilliant cells. Brilliant. Can you we also got a... Sorry. Oh no, I was just mm -hmm. saying no, it's... no question, sure. don't worry. <laughs> mm -hmm. We've also got a um, a question online from uh, from Fias. Um mm -hmm. so Fias has asked, has said, thank you for the interesting talk. Um how does PLIP perform in comparison to the state of the art? Uh, with non-zero shot learning um, classification models on Cather 100K. Yeah, yeah. So this is a great question. Uh, we're gonna introduce in the following slides. Yeah. So we first start with zero shot, and then we look into the transfer learning. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so we first dive into the PANDUC data set by looking to um, those 19 different organs, and we found clip achieved better zero shot F1 score on 16 out of 19 different organs with seven organ types achieve higher F1 score greater than 0 0.8. Uh, while the baseline click performs only around 0 0.3 to 0 0.6. So zero shot is useful when user want to simply plug and play in a model, uh, plug and play the model in a new environment. Um, However, in order to get a higher accuracy in a uh, while well in a relatively efficient approach is to simply build a classifier, linear classifier on top of the image embedding. 
uh, extracted from the plate image encoder. So this is so-called linear problem. Essentially, we uh, make the image encoder be frozen. And just to get the um, image information from the original RGB image to, to get a vector. And then we build a classifier on top of the vector. This is uh, a generally a very fast way to train a model quickly. Um, it's, uh, it's very useful to quickly fine tune a model, especially for a task specific problem in within a minute, since we make the image encoder frozen, right? So to evaluate whether the model performed better image representation for training model, we test it on the same four external data set and compare with other fine-tuned linear problem models, including the um, original clip model and Moody Pass model. So those uh, so clip model was were pre-trained with large data set, including some of the pathology images. And the Moody Pass was a, another um, method proposed uh, earlier that was pre-trained on more than, I guess it's more than 800,000 pathology images. So the results suggest that PLIP achieved state-of-the-art performances in terms of weighted F1 scores. And zero shot suggesting us uh, we can generally achieve uh, on average 0 0.85 to 89 or to 92 um, F1 score. So what we can do for further research studies, instead of uh, efficient fine tuning with linear probing, if we want to further, uh, if we want to in, um, really want to pursue higher accuracy on a classification task in pathology, um, or if, you, if the uh, user just simply wish to fine tune the entire image encoder for best performance, flip would be the great choice. Um, so we compare the end-to-end -end supervised learning algorithm, the Vision Transformer Base32, which was pre-trained on ImageNet uh, versus our PLIP model, which was pre-trained on OpenPath. And we found um, when fine-tuning the entire image encoder image backbone, um, the PLIP model can achieve a higher F1 score compared to the same model architecture but was pre-trained on ImageNet, which suggesting for pathology-related task, it is better to use PLIP as a starting model for best downstream tasks. And the improvement is especially large when the training set size is small. For example, if we do not have a large data set uh, to get started with, maybe if we only have 1% of lung cancer training data, Flip can still easily achieve 82.82 F1 score compared to around 0.65 F1 score for the same architecture, um, but pre-trained on ImageNet, right? So the conclusion is uh, with the same data, same model architecture, the, the pre-trained model on OpenPath can offer you a better understanding initially uh, about pathology related thing. Yep. So I personally, um, following up to this study, uh, we further use PLIP to, to do a lot of uh, downstream tasks. Uh, we, yeah, we really like using PLIP in our own study. So that's, uh, that's perhaps I think uh, what, it, uh, I, that's perhaps what I think uh, the usefulness for, uh, for the academia research. Yep. So we have demonstrated the usefulness of PLIP in academia, academic research. Now I want to uh, share the utility of flip model for educational purpose and second opinions through the image retrieval. So we first focus on the text to image retrieval. Similar to the Google search, user can input any text right here and the text encoder will compare and then match the most similar image in the candidate pool. When we want to recall, um, interesting cases in the database. And the selection is based on cosine similarity on the embedding space, right? Because we have aligned the image and text uh, through the contrastive learning. <clears throat> but unlike Google search, we here we directly match the text to image in the embedding space. So potentially allow the best searching experience. 
we always compare the performance with Google, but uh, we do have uh, we do lack a direct comparison, a quantitative measurements to justify we are better than Google. But um, I think it's slightly better than Google on searching some of the different uh, images. So we evaluate the text to image retrieval task on Twitter validation data set, which dated after November 15, 2022 to January 15, 2023. Um, those contains 2,023 unique image and text pairs. In addition, we also evaluate in three additional independent data sets, including the Passpedia website, PubMed collection, and books, pathology book collection. And here uh, you can see some of the example captions from those four different data resources. Can I ask so you a we... question here as well, please? Yep. Is it? <clears throat> so, um, not your question, sorry, for me. So, is the main sort of use case for this sort of text to image retrieval, is it for education, for teaching? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, in relation to this model. Sorry, can you repeat? Yeah, so um, with this model where you're doing this text image retrieval, is is mm -hmm. the main use case that you would see? Uh, is it is the is the end user a pathologist or a trainee pathologist? Is that the is that mm -hmm. the idea behind this yeah. particular part? Yeah, 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 this is a great question. So we think it can at least be used for education. It maybe can potentially be used in clinical, real clinical setting, but that requires FDA approval, right? So right now, let's just say it's at least good for learning things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is that all the question? Uh, yeah, that's all for me for now. Yeah, oh, please oh, carry oh, on. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Yeah, this is a great, great question. Yeah. Um. So okay. So we use recall at top ten or recall at top fifty to measure the effectiveness of a retrieval system. So basically, it just calculates the proportion of the target images that were successfully retrieved within the top ten or top 50 images retrieved by the model. So basically we test all the um, captions in each different data set and to see uh, whether the target images, whether the associated image is appeared within the top 10 or top 50 retrieved images. Um, and we calculate the overall ratio um, to get the recall at 10 and recall at 50. So the final score is ranging from zero to one, which one means we we can always get the target image from the top ten retrieval. So we can we can feel that the task can be very challenging, right? Because one sentence can potentially map to many images, and many images may look the same in um, in the database. But still, we observe a huge improvement compared to the clip model with an average improvement of over four folds and average, average improvement of 15 folds compared to the random retrieval results. For example, for Twitter uh, dataset, we have uh, 2, 000, over 2,000 candidates. And the recall at top 50 suggests if we use each image's associated caption to try to retrieve the image, the correct image will have 52% chance to be appear on the top 50 retrieved images. So that's how we measure the recall value. Yeah, so that's the definition of the recall value. And now people, uh, we can use PLIP to be as a search engine uh, in our web demo. So the PLIP is able to comprehend the text described by the user. For example, if the input is breast tumor surrounded by fat, it will return you the closest match, uh, which is this image. If your input is colorectal cancer tumor on the epithelium, the best match also um, makes sense to me. Uh, well, I'm not a pathologist, but it looks familiar to me. Yeah, so however, the success of text -to image retrieval may depend on many factors. Uh, one factor is if the input text associated image are not indexed into the database, such as the database we collect, OpenPath, then the system may be unable to return the target or the relevant item. Um, the other limitation is, uh, although um, 
it is a very challenging task and we achieve a higher score compared to other baseline model, but it's still not perfect. So we, um, we would expect our ideal image would, uh, will not be retrieved among the top five or top 10. Um, so, but I, I personally do feel it is a very useful tool as a non-pathologist researcher. Sometimes I do spend uh, time searching pathology images on this uh, search engine. So next, um, Flip can also perform image to image retrieval. So this is similar to text or image retrieval, but the input now becomes image. The system will compare the input image with all candidate images indexed in the database, same as um, previous, and return the one with highest cosine similarity. And this is very useful when users wish to search similar images for educational purpose, or maybe seeking for second opinion, or maybe for clinical practices. And as we mentioned before, this can allow users to compare their cases with other classic cases in the database or the previous cases they, they might gone over before. So um, yeah, so this can be very useful. Um, so we evaluate the image to image retrieval task under three unique data sets, each with a specific focus, including the nine different tissue types in Kessler data set, um, 19 different organ types from pandemic data set and 24 different staining styles in the Chemia path 24C data set. So this is like three different retrieval tasks, I, uh, uh, focusing on different retrieving tasks. And um, among all the evaluation, our PLIP model achieved the state of the state of the art retrieval performances over the K on the class retrieval accuracy. Um, compared to maybe the second best is the is the Sish model, which was proposed in 2022. Yeah, so now Flip can be used to search similar images. In the left example, we input an image that contains mitotic figure at here. And the top results suggest Flip's ability to understand the key concept from the input image. The mitotic image, uh, the mitotic figure. Uh, those black little dots right here is extremely useful but uh, to identify, but it's also super tedious for clinicians to quantify it. In a host line image, typically contain up to a million cells. Um, mitotic figure maybe could be uh, appeared at anywhere, but it's just so rare to find. It might be ex especially proliferated in the tumoral region, which can be, uh, which is a very um, important uh, criteria to determine the tumor uh, progress or uh, the tumor stage. Um, oh, is the tumor great, not the tumor stage? Because the more metallic figure you observe within the tumor tissue, it will generally suggesting the tumor is growing faster than your expectation. So this is how we grading the tumor. Um, it is important to find, but it is also tedious to find. So which finding the mitotic figure is a whole different uh, research topic. Um, perhaps maybe I can share my uh, experience later. Yeah, so basically we can, uh, the plate engine can be used to find the similar images, which contain also contain mitotic figure. And on the right-hand side, we, we show another example that flip can retrieve a very close image to what we have. Um, we, we, we present the top retrieval in the Twitter um, web frame, where I think the second image is the match to our input image. And here's a summary. Um, so we, we, the flip summary is uh, we show that public data annotated with nature language from the internet by a, a group of pathologists is a tremendous resource to advance pathology AI. And the model, uh, the, the, uh, the fine-tuned model flip can perform various of downstream tasks, such as zero-shot and linear probing for research purpose and image retrieval and second opinion 
um, for educational purpose. Yeah, so um, our work now is publishing nature medicine and we're excited that this work will be uh, has featured on September uh, cover and here's a link to the paper. And now um, we can use uh, start using Plate for research. Here's is the online Google Colab tutorial. We can easily download and fine tune the model within just few lines and to achieve various uh, tasks. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Um, I'm gonna go to the next. Um, so um, when mentioning, when bringing up the PLIP and OpenPASS, there are uh, also other great vision language medical AI uh, that worth to mention. For example, Biomed Clip, uh, which use PubMed image, images with many radiology images, um, and Quilm, from University of Washington is also based on OpenPass with additional data curated from YouTube videos, which I think is a really clever idea. Um, they basically curate, the, they basically download over 4,000 YouTube videos about pathology um, presentations and extract important keyframes from the videos along with the speech to text um, converted description which results in over a million image and text fears. So that is a really clever idea. So we're really exciting to see people pushing this area forward. And here's my take on the current limitation um, and also my opinion. My opinion could be incorrect and my opinion could be changed over the time. But here uh, is what my um, current thoughts. Um, when we Bringing up one question and try to solve it, we usually will find, find a subsequent list of other questions that to be solved. First, we found that um, although we propose a foundation model for pathology, but really there's still a lack of a highly reliable vision foundation model to actually solve all the medical imaging problems. And second is the hallucination. Um, Clip-like model could be a very useful tool to uh, alleviate the hallucination problem because our retrieval will always be the real um, images. But uh, if we want to deal with uh, generative AI models such as um, Blip2 model or Flamingo model or like simply multi-model GPT-4, the issue of hallucination will greatly undermine the trust between human and AI. Right, so that's the other, the second issue. But I think people are pushing this forward and we're also working on this. And third is we have to accept the fact that medical images are fundamentally different from general vision images. Um, 10 years ago, or maybe even earlier, we proposed ImageNet, which contains over 14 million of annotated, carefully annotated data set. That annotation, it, for uh, non-medical images is way cheaper than annotating medical images, right? Because clinicians, they are uh, annotating the med medical images require expert clinicians to do that task. Uh, so which, re which needs to require a very high educational, um, high, higher information than annotating like dog, cat, or car. And here's, a, I always raise the example to uh, explain the difference between medical image and other image. An adult um, can easily learn how to drive a car within 17 hours, within 17 hours. But a medical student needs to learn eight years to become a clinician, right? So that's the difference between uh, learning a task in autonomous driving versus learning a task in medical AI. And we're still not solving the autonomous driving problem. So medical AI is way to go. Yeah, so that's my current take. So um, last but not the least, I would like to thank my collaborators and advisor. Federico is the co-first author of this paper. He's truly a genius computer scientist. Mert is a fantastic and talented researcher. 
and our advisors. Tom is the chair of pathology department and Jane is our PI leading this research. Without their guidance, we couldn't achieve this uh, progress. So thank you. Oh, one more thing. In the universe of data-centric foundation AI, we will release the OpenPath V2 in the coming months. This, this is going to be the next largest pathology image text and VQA data set like never before. Along with that is our brand new AI system. <laughs> I'm pitching this too much, but um, so stay tuned and please subscribe to my Twitter account for updates. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much, Steve. That was a really interesting talk. And uh, congratulations on, well, yeah, it's a good box, it's a good paper, and such a good piece of work. Um, so, so with that, I suppose I'll open the floor to questions. Does anyone have any questions to start with? I know we've got some online already, but should I start with the online questions? Mm -hmm. So um, we've got a comment on a question online saying, thanks Z for the great talk. I have a couple of questions. So the first question mm -hmm. was, it seems that IHC stained images were also scrapped and used um, also scrapped and not used during the training of PLIP. Have you evaluated yes. the performance of PLIP on any tasks that do include IHC images except for image retrieval? Yeah, yeah. So this is a great, uh, great question. Um, in the open pass, we do have a bunch of IHC images curated from the Twitter and other forums. Um, but yeah, we 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 haven't really. Um, evaluates the IHC performance dedicatedly in this paper. So yeah, so that is a great question. We uh, in, in our next data set, we do curate a bunch of IHC images, um, which maybe we, we could uh, evaluate the performance on retrieval task, maybe uh, maybe in the next paper. Yes. That's really great. interesting to see. Yeah. We've also got a second question online. So um, it's that the reported task all include analysis of image tiles, how would it extend to WSI level analyses, such as WSI to WSI retrieval or test to WSI retrieval? Text, yeah. yeah. Text, yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, if I, uh, can I understand the question? Like uh, we have done the image and text retrieval on the patch level. What about exactly. the slide level? Sure, yeah. So um, yeah, it is very interesting task. Um, and I previously, I worked on a lot of host line images uh, uh, related projects. Um, this project is more based on the patch level, primarily just because OpenPath dataset is all about patches. Um, those patches could be host line image, but with very low magnification, right? It's just like a thumbnail of an entire tissue, but really uh, we cannot zoom in to see the detail. It may also include a very high, uh, a bunch of image patch with very high power view. We can see the exact uh, cells inside of the image. But overall, the retrieval task we're evaluating is on patch level. Um, first is because the data set by nature about data set. Second is uh, the, the use case. In reality, we imagine pathologists could use it. For example, when navigating a slide on a um, pathology viewer, um, they crop a region and then compared to what we have in our open data dataset. Um, so that region they cropped is a like image patch. They could also crop the entire whole slide image in a very low magnification, which can also find the potential match. But here, um, yeah, so that's what we are interested in. So we expect clinicians to find their region of interest instead of AI to or machine to find it. And that's how we're, that's the reason why we focus on patch level. Thank you. Um, so I've got a question actually as well. So, well, it's all, everything's, um, the model's available online, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I saw, yeah. I saw the demo, I saw the demo uh, website, which is, uh, it's very cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So have we got any more questions in, in our group talk? Uh, well, I can finish with one last question then. So my I, my concern, I suppose, always with sort of these foundation models is, is that they might be great for some of your really broad tasks, but when you mm -hmm. actually get something slightly more niche, um, how 
do they generally just fail? Or so I know you, you were talking about obviously fine tuning the models on top of this, but have you mm-hmm. tried just using the raw models on, on quite a more niche task than say malignant versus benign? Um, so the question is about uh, whether this uh, model can be used for finding benign or malignant. Um, like so, any... of, of, of course, in your, in, your, in your talk, you've talked about um, classifying as either benign or malignant, say, on over the pandemic data set, for instance. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my, my question is, have you tried to use these models for more niche actual, like more niche tasks uh, at all? Uh, such as finding really, I don't know, it's a, it's a difficult, difficult question, I suppose. Yes, uh, we we haven't evaluated, uh, we haven't done it. Uh, I mean, like there could be many more uh, ways to evaluate the model performance. And yeah, so yeah, it could be interesting to further explore if the model can able to handle it. Thank you. And we've got, we've got one final question as well online. Uh, that says, because the model sees Im- images from different magnifications during training, in your future mm-hmm. research, it will also be interesting to see how the model generalizes to different magnifications. For example, solving the same task but using different magnifications. So more, more of a common than a question, I suppose. No, that's brilliant. Well, thank you very much. If you haven't got any more burning questions, then I suppose we'll, uh, we'll end it there. But our, our, um, our next seminar is in two weeks time on the 16th of October, um, where we'll be joined um, online with Dr. Yuri Tolkark from University Hospital Cologne in Germany. So hope to see you all there. And again, thank you very much, Steve, for a really, really interesting talk. Thank you. And best of luck with the next uh, the next stages of the work. Yeah, have a good day. Bye-bye. You too. See ya. Thank you.